Happy Monday, and welcome to another episode of Cases That Should Have Gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, but didn't. Today, we're talking about the disclosure of restitution claims. Cases that should have gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, but didn't. Gilbert Robinson was charged with the murder of his estranged wife, and in the course of his trial, it became known to him, while the trial was happening, that the Victim Services Department was in possession of restitution claims made by some of the victims, the family members and friends of the uh, deceased individual in the trial. Mr. Robinson applied for a mistrial on the basis of the Crown's failure to disclose the restitution claims to him, arguing that they could have impacted the course of the trial, the course of his cross-examination of the witnesses, the assessments of credibility, and the entire process and, and theory of the defense case. The application for a mistrial was dismissed, Mr. Robinson appealed, and the Court of Appeal dismissed his appeal. Mr. Robinson obviously sought leave to the Supreme Court of Canada, which itself was dismissed. But this case raises very important issues, not just on the idea of the remedy of a mistrial for a failure to disclose, but also about the issue of who actually has an obligation to disclose information. There appears to not be a consistent standard across the country. Victim services organizations, which are often run by the government, through police services, or alternatively through the Crown or through the uh, um, provincial government offices, in those circumstances they're in possession of records that might relate to the credibility of certain witnesses, their motive to fabricate evidence, things they have to financially gain from somebody's death. Obviously, claims for restitution can have a significant bearing on the credibility of witnesses and the direction that an individual takes in conducting their defense in a trial. And so for these things not to be disclosed as a matter of course in the trial proper, on the basis of the fact that they're not in possession of the Crown, is a little bit absurd when you consider their direct relevance to the case and the fact that they're in the possession either of the investigating body or of a government office itself. And so this was a very important issue that the Supreme Court of Canada ought to have considered. How far do the disclosure obligations go? And why is it that this information wouldn't be disclosed when it can be relevant? And is it fair for governments to separate victim services offices from the prosecution office or from the police in order to silo disclosure away? And if there is a potential that that's being done intentionally, or at least knowingly, is going to prevent somebody from obtaining disclosure in their case, is that not something that mitigates in favor? of providing the disclosure? And what about the failure to disclose? Shouldn't that warrant a remedy of a mistrial when the failure to disclose is something that's discovered only after a conviction has been entered, like in the circumstances of victim impact statements and restitution claims? Certainly, of course, if those statements are obtained and the claims for restitution are only made after the conviction's been entered, that's one thing. But if all of this information was in the possession of the uh, victim services and could have been in the possession of the Crown had it just been forwarded sooner, doesn't that mitigate in favor of disclosure of it? And doesn't that increase the likelihood that a mistrial or a miscarriage of justice has occurred? And while mistrials are supposed to be only granted in the clearest of cases, where is the line? Where is the bright line for when disclosure problems become a mistrial? The Supreme Court of Canada had the opportunity to weigh in on all of this, and all of this has important, significant implications for criminal trials across the country every single day. Late and missing disclosure is an ongoing issue in criminal trials in every courtroom in every courthouse of the country. And so for the Supreme Court of Canada to just say we're not going to get involved in this issue, that raises significant concerns that there are going to be more cases where disclosure is potentially going to be withheld either deliberately or negligently, resulting in convictions that may never have happened had the course of the trial been different had the disclosure been made. This is not what we need in our justice system, and the Supreme Court of Canada should take the next opportunity it has to hear a type of case that deals with mistrials as a remedy for lost disclosure or missing disclosure, and deals with the expansive interpretation of what should be in possession of the investigating body, particularly as a follow-up to the implication that they made in Regina and Gubbins that 
the disclosure is supposed to be provided in circumstances where it's in the possession of the investigating body or should be in the possession of the investigating body. How is Gubbins reconcilable with the outcome in Mr. Robinson's case? All of this should have gone to the Supreme Court of Canada and it's going to take another case for these issues to be resolved. Cases that should have gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, but didn't. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Cases That Should Have Gone to the Supreme Court of Canada But Didn't. I'm Kyla Lee at Acumen Law Corporation. Thank you to Brazen Bull Creative for putting together these videos. Please like, subscribe, and share with your friends.